I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the night, and then we'll try to open up some windows and stuff here, too, to help cool the place off this evening. Um, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Harry Adelson. He has performed nearly 5,000 bone marrow and adipose-derived adult stem cell procedures, placing him among the most experienced in the world with the use of anogalous, uh, sorry, autogalous stem cells for the treatment of musculoskeletal pain conditions. In 2016, Dr. Addison became the stem cell director, uh, sorry, doctor to Dave Asprey, who some of you here may know. As he, as, he, as he puts it, after 20 years of working my fingers to the bone, I became an overnight success. He is the founder of the Dorsair Clinics and practices in Park City, Utah. If I butchered that pronunciation, please correct me when they go. So please welcome Dr. Harry Adelson. Thank you very much, you guys. So when I was younger, I was completely fanatical about rock climbing. My entire life revolved around rock climbing. Really, the reason I went to naturopathic school was so I'd have something to do when I wasn't rock climbing. And <clears throat> I was training, uh, I was wrapping up my first year of naturopathic school in Portland, Oregon, and I was training for a dream trip to France, the birthplace of modern sport climbing. And I felt this, I was in the gym, and I was doing this hard move, and I felt this grotesque pop in my shoulder. And I just thought, oh man, that's not good. And um, saw a surgeon, and he you know, had an MRI, and he, I was told I had a piece of torn cartilage in my shoulder. And um, really, I, I tried naturopathic medicine to, to you know, what we were learning at school to, to treat it, and really nothing would touch it. It was really very painful. And I saw a surgeon, and he said, well, you know, I can put a scope in there, and I can cut away that piece of cartilage, um, it's going to help you in the short term, but it's probably going to give you problems later in life. And I just was not willing to take no for an answer. I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. I mean, here I was, I was at the time, I was in my early 20s, I was extremely healthy, I was in naturopathic school, and the guiding principles of naturopathic medicine is using the body's ability to heal itself. And really, that's another way to say biohacking. Now, back then, this was in the, in the early to mid-1990s, we didn't have the term biohacking. I'm not even sure we had the term hacking at that point. Uh, but, you know, I, I knew that there had to be a way that I should, I, I should be able to jumpstart my body's ability to heal itself after injury. I was introduced to this man, Rick Marinelli, who was the first naturopathic doctor to do uh, prolotherapy, regenerative injection therapy. And he treated me with prolotherapy, and it resulted in a complete cure. And from that experience, that's really what set me on this path. And my, you know, sort of my life path unfolded before me. And um, and by the way, my trip to France was splendid. <laughs> so um, I'll tell you a little bit about prolotherapy and regenerative injection therapy. I was talking to a doctor here who, who's a prolotherapist. Just to give you a little bit of background, because stem cell therapy really is the natural evolution of prolotherapy. The basic premise behind prolotherapy is this whole concept between macro, macroscopic pain generators and microscopic pain generators. So a macroscopic pain generator would be like you have a broken bone and you take an x-ray of that broken bone and that's the problem, you have a broken bone. The thing is most pain generators, people living with chronic pain, what you see on the imaging actually isn't the problem. If you do uh, MRIs of 100 people with no low back pain, people who never had low back pain, and you do an MRI on them, 60% of them are going to have abnormalities on their MRI. 15% of them are going to have abnormalities so significant that if they had corresponding symptoms, which they don't, they would be candidates for immediate emergency surgery. Similarly, when you take people with lots of back pain, especially neck pain, Frequently, they have perfectly normal-looking MRIs. So what does that tell us? You know, the American College of Physicians, which is the granddaddy of all medical organizations, has put out, in 2011, they put out a, a position paper which said, stop ordering MRIs for people with back pain. In, if somebody has a, 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 a neurologic deficit, so they've got drop foot, they've got loss of fecal continence, okay, that's a good time to order an MRI. If you suspect cancer, that's a good time to order an MRI. Shy of that, 
they're really just for not what we call non-specific low back pain. The only thing you're achieving by ordering an MRI is you're sending somebody down some very expensive and potentially dangerous rabbit holes. The only thing we know for sure that ordering an MRI is going to do, it's going to increase the cost of, of whatever that person's treatment is. And that's really it. It does not help the outcomes at all. So what does that tell us? I mean, that tells us that what it is that we see in the images probably isn't even the problem. That it probably isn't the pain generator. So that shifts our focus to the microscopic level. So the two main things that we're looking at at the microscopic level, one is the collagen matrix. So you know, our connective tissue is a miracle fabric. It stretches just the right amount in each direction. When it's stretching, the nerves that pass through it, the sensory nerves, pass freely through it. It doesn't get caught up. You're not firing pain signals every time you move your arm because those, those fascial planes are just move freely, just the right amount. Well, when you have what we call suboptimal healing, so you have an injury, you go through a healing phase, and you don't completely heal. You have, you have changes in the microscopic anatomy. What ends up happening is your miracle fabric then loses its miracle properties. It stretches too much in some directions and not enough in others. And more importantly, those sensory nerve fibers that pass through it don't pass freely through it. it they get caught up, they, 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 get, they get snagged, and they fire pain signals with movement. The other thing that happens on the microscopic level is what's called neovascularization. And neovascularization is the hyperconcentration of irregularly formed blood vessels. And this is something that we've known about for a long time that occurs. When you have injury, when you have an injured area, it tends to trigger the growth of irregularly shaped blood vessels. We don't know exactly why this is. We, you know, we used to think that it was the body's attempt to bring more blood vessel, you know, bring more blood flow to the area, but these are irregularly shaped. So instead of efficiently bringing oxygen to the area and bringing metabolic waste away, you actually lose that ability. You actually are having difficulty getting oxygen to the area and getting metabolic waste away. The other problem with neovascularization is every time you grow a new blood vessel, you also grow a new sensory nerve along next to it. And so now you have a hyper concentration of sensory nerves. Now, this neovascularization, we've known for a long time, it's something, we've known that that's what happens in tendinitis, like tennis elbow, golf elbow, something like that. But what we've learned in recent years is this happens in arthritis. When you have a degeneration of, a, of an articulation, you actually get these irregular shaped blood vessels in the joint. So you also, that also happens in the spinal canal. When people have spinal abnormalities, you're actually having this loss of the ability to bring oxygen to the area, nutrients to the area, metabolic waste such as carbon uh, dioxide away from the area. So <clears throat> you, when we look at this concept of you know, these microscopic beds of connective tissue being the pain generator, what that does is it sort of shifts the whole concept of what it is, what our approach is as a doctor. In conventional pain management, in orthopedic surgery, we look at the body, you know, those guys look at the body like a, an engine comprised of individual parts, and the way you determine which part needs to be replaced or repaired is by looking at the MRI. And part of that is because that's how our medical system is based. With third payer, you know, with insurance medicine, you have to justify, like, you're my patient, but I'm actually, you're not my client. The insurance company is my client, and you're just sort of this commodity, and I have to justify to the insurance company why it is I'm doing something, and they want objective evidence, like an MRI. So I have to be able to say, this is the reason that I'm treating that, even though we know there's all this data to show that that might have nothing to do with what's causing your pain. So, I mean, it, it really just, unfortunately, that is what directs so much of clinical decision making in conventional care. We use the MRI to dictate to us which part needs replacing or repairing. Whereas in a regenerative medicine, my, the field of, that I'm in, we view the body as a garden. And gardens are comprised of tissue beds. And the way we determine which tissue bed needs tending is I ask the patient a question, 
And then when they tell me the answer, I actually listen. That's sort of the key part, part there. Um, and that's sort of a lost art in and of itself. So we, if we're thinking that, you know, we're thinking of these tissue beds in our body that, that need, you know, to be restored to health, how does the body in nature heal itself? So let's just back up and talk about that. Well, blood vessels are ubiquitous. With just a couple of exceptions, there's blood vessels in virtually every tissue in the body. And um, these plasticized models, I love this image. If you've been to any of those, the body's exhibit or anything like that, the ones that I find really fascinating are these ones of the blood vessels because, you know, they're everywhere. And so whenever you have an injury, it involves blood vessels. When you have an injury to a blood vessel, the, con the, the contents of the blood vessel, blood, now finds itself outside of the blood vessel. That's the body's signal that something's wrong. The blood finds itself outside of a blood vessel. So blood is comprised of the serum, and then the cellular components are the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets. The platelets, when they find themselves outside of a blood vessel, they're really the whole signaling mechanism that something's gone wrong. They release a protein called platelet-derived growth factor. And platelet-derived growth factor is like the main signaling mechanism that there's been an injury. Now, surrounding these blood vessels are cells called pericytes. They wrap around the blood vessel. When pericytes constrict, you get vasoconstriction. When pericytes relax, you get vasodilatation. So when you have changes in blood pressure that are caused by narrowing of the blood vessels and widening of the blood vessels, vasoconstriction, vasodilatation, that is the action of pericytes. So a lot of drugs that impact your blood pressure exert their effect on the pericytes. When pericytes come into contact with this platelet-derived growth factor, when the platelets find themselves outside a blood vessel, they release platelet-derived growth factor, that comes into contact with the pericytes. The pericytes actually detach off of the blood vessel and morph into what's called a mesenchymal stem cell. Now, mesenchymal stem cells, if mesenchymal stem cells are Superman, then pericytes are Clark Kent, right? Uh, mesenchymal stem cells have two superhuman powers. One of them is they have the ability to differentiate into target tissue cells. So a stem cell, what makes a stem cell a stem cell is it has the ability to self-replicate, it has the ability to turn into a new version of itself, or it has the ability to turn into a target tissue cell. With MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, they have the ability of turning into any of the musculoskeletal connective tissue uh, cell types. They also, much more importantly, for the, for the basis of this conversation, uh, exert what's called a paracrine effect. Paracrine means intercellular communication. So they actually, these, these MSCs, have the ability to recognize when they're in the presence of damaged tissue. When they are in the presence of damaged tissue, they release this whole cascade of growth factors that control inflammation, kill invading microbes, and trigger the growth of new connective tissue. Most importantly, new blood vessels. So if neovascularization is the growth of irregularly shaped abnormal blood vessels, uh, uh, angiogenesis is the growth of healthy, good, healthy blood vessels. So take, for instance, uh, wounds, you know, wound healing. So when you have, a, when you have a, 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 some sort of ulcer on your skin, the way an ulcer heals is first you grow blood vessels, then you grow skin over top. So effectively, whenever we have healing after injury in any tissue in our body, it is a stem cell mediated event. That's how the body heals itself in nature. We have stem cells in virtually every tissue in our body, and their job is to, uh, to maintain the health of their micro environment. The problem is as we go through life and put a lot of wear and tear on our body, have major trauma, have uh, repetitive micro trauma, we can actually overwhelm the body's ability to heal itself uh, after injury. And that's when you get degeneration. So, um, so let's move forward. So that's, you know, that's, how, that's how the body heals itself naturally after injury. So how does that translate back to regenerative injection therapy, regenerative medicine? Well, it started with prolotherapy. So back when I was first treated in the 90s, it was with prolotherapy. 
And the doctor that I was talking to, who's the prolotherapist, is where, where there you are, great. Um, yeah, prolotherapy is the injection of a natural substance, which is generally like a dextro, the most commonly used is like a 12.5% dextrose solution. Uh, there's other agents that are used, but it's whatever it is, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, substance that is simultaneously nutritive and slightly irritating. So we're, we're giving the body the nutrition that it needs, but we're also just like giving a hyper-concentrated solution that, is, that causes just like a controlled, mild inflammation. What that does is it affects, effectively tricks the body into thinking that it's endured a new injury without actually having caused any real tissue damage, thereby launching the body's natural ability to heal itself. Um, so I practiced prolotherapy when I was still in naturopathic school in the 90s. And um, I was very fortunate to have done one of the very few hospital-based residencies for naturopathic doctors. It was in Derby, Connecticut. And when I was there, I mean, it was like a big deal that I was even allowed in the door, you know, as, a, as an ND. Like, it was pretty awesome that I was even allowed to be there. There was no way they were going to let me do prolotherapy on the residence, right? But I had to, you know, I had to practice. I had taken it and, you know, I'd taken some courses and I needed to start doing it. So I found out about this organization, actually the Hemwall organization, that, that, the Hackett Hemwall organization. Um, and I contacted them, and they do this trip where they take a bunch of doctors to Honduras. And um, they, 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 they basically get all these medically underserved people, and they line them up, and you know, there's all these people who are living with pain, and um, they, they all show up together, and then they do a bunch of prolotherapy treatments. Well, I signed up to go, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't take naturopaths. It's because, you, you know, in the Honduran law, this and that, and it was... There were some answers there, none of the, which none of them really made any sense to me. So I, uh, I was uh, sort of upset that I wasn't invited. So I decided that, you know what? Here in the United States of America, there actually are poor people. I don't have to go to Central America to treat poor people. So I, uh, I reached out to, the, to this. I found the largest uh, homeless shelter in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And uh, this was a 50-bed homeless shelter that was like basically like a halfway house, and it was a it was a Christian-run one. And so I, you know, I I knew that the the state-run ones were like this mountain of red tape, but the Christian ones, like they could do whatever they wanted. So I went in and I basically just like knocked on the door and went in and introduced myself to the director. And I said, "Hi, I'm you know I'm a I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm a first-year resident. Um, I do this therapy. It's it involves injections. It's for the treatment of chronic pain." I would like to practice on your residence. And as I was saying it, I was like, this must sound completely crazy. Like, what is this lady gonna think? And, she, and I just remember she looked at me and she said, okay, do you have your stuff? Can you start now? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And so anyway, my first two years of doing prolotherapy was on these guys, and it was fantastic. Like, they were, I loved working with these guys. It was, I learned so much from them. They were like, it was just a fantastic experience. So prolotherapy is, uh, you know, it's very simple. It's usually, it's done with just palpation, uh, not no imaging, and you sort of just, you know, find the painful area, and you know your anatomy, and you inject the, what you believe to be the affected structures. And I did that for the first uh, four years of my private practice, and it worked very well. Um, I just found that, you know, you had to do a lot of treatments. I mean, it was typical to do six, eight, ten treatments once a month for a period of, you know, over, I'd see someone multiple times over a period of a year. It didn't work as well for really advanced cases, like the bone on bone and that sort of thing. Well, in 2006, um, one of my naturopathic colleagues found out about platelet-rich plasma, and this was sort of a brand new thing. And so the idea is, instead of injecting dextrose, you do a blood draw, put the blood in a centrifuge, concentrate down the platelets, and use that in your prolotherapy solution. You inject platelets. Now, as you remember, the, the cascade is first you have injury, then platelets come to the area. Platelets release these growth factors that trigger the stem cells to activate. So really, it's the same concept. We're just skipping a step. We're just, in, you know, we're, we're same injections, my, my mentor used to say, same sheet music, different instrument. So we're just taking the blood platelets and injecting those. 
So from 2006 to 2010, that became 100% of my practice. And what I found was now instead of 8, 10, 12 treatments spread out over a year, I was doing four, six treatments uh, spread out, like, you know, each one every two months. I mean, really, like, I was able to do it in many fewer treatments. Uh, it just sort of seemed to me like anything prolotherapy could do, PRP could do better. We found that, you know, because it was a little more involved, it sort of, uh, it, it seemed reasonable that the injections should be a little more precise. So we started using ultrasound guidance. And um, that sort of became common practice, especially among the naturopaths doing prolotherapy and PRP, was to use ultrasound guidance, because you could actually see the needle. And that's kind of what just confused this computer, as I had a video in there of showing what ultrasound guidance looks like. So then in 2000, so, so then suddenly, like, my practice kind of bumped up a little bit in complexity. And, um, but, you know, I was very happy with this, and I thought this was what I would do for the rest of my career, and um, didn't really think m much else could, I thought we were at the pinnacle of where we could go with all of this. So then in 2010, this is a patient of mine who I had treated for years. Her name is Laura. And um, I had, I'd had, pr I had pretty good success with her with prolotherapy. Then we, you know, but I just couldn't quite get her where she needed. And then we started doing platelet-rich plasma. And we, I still just couldn't quite get her where she needed to be. She had a very, she had had a serious traumatic injury to her knee, a lot of degeneration. And, um, you know, we just couldn't quite get her there. So she shows up in my office, brain, engineer, brainiac, stack of journals like this, puts them on my desk. It's all medical journals, um, the use of bone marrow-derived stem cells for the treatment of arthritis. It was all animal studies, because that's all it really was back in 2010. And she put it on my desk, and she said, Harry, I want you to inject my bone marrow into my knee. And I said, Laura, I don't know how. And she said, so, learn. <laughs> and I said, Laura, I mean, I've heard of this. I, I know a guy in um, St. Louis who does this. You could go to him. And she said, I don't want your friend to do it. I want you to do it. And I said, Laura, I'm a naturopath. Like, we don't do that, you know? I mean, do you know how much criticism I would get if I started doing bone marrow aspirations? And she goes, well, I'm an engineer for NASA, and I'm a woman. So if you'd like to complain about people saying you're out of your league, you're really talking to the wrong person here. And so I said, you know, I really couldn't argue with that. So you know, I found a, a, a surgeon in uh, Florida, Joe, Joe Perita. And he let, you know, I, I sort of, at that time, there were like 10 people in the United States doing bone marrow stem cells. And I called the first nine. And like, they didn't just hang up on me. They like threw the phone across the room. Like, they were just like, <laughs> so, but, and Joe was the 10th person I called. And he's like, yeah, sure, come on down. When do you want to come? So I, I went down and watched him do a couple of procedures. And um, that was it. I, this, I came home and started doing it. And man, it worked so well. Like I was, after, you know, I'd been doing full-time prolotherapy for four years. Then I'd been doing full-time platelet-rich plasma for four years. And then I started doing this. And it was just like, now instead of four to six treatments, now I was doing like two treatments. And like the really advanced bone-on-bone -bone cases. And, and not everybody. I mean, I, there were, I had people who I didn't help. You know, I still have people I don't help at all. But overall, like the 80% of the people I was seeing were having these like remarkable outcomes. Bone marrow is, you know, bone is comprised of the hard outer cortical bone and then the spongy medullary cavity, the spongy bone on the inside. And it's super rich with stem cells. But it's not only stem cells. It also, like it's raw bone broth from your own body. I mean, it has all these other constituents in it that are like just chock full of stuff that are like your body's natural drugstore. I mean, this is all the stuff, when, when we have injury, this is like the soup that is responsible for tissue healing. So I started doing uh, ultrasound guided uh, bone marrow aspiration. So back then there was like nothing going on. There were no trainings, there was nothing in the literature. So this group, American Academy Anti-Aging Medicine, put on this, uh, they called it a fellowship, which is a very loose use of the term. But I went, I went and did it. I was in the first class of, of uh, stem cell medicine. And um, there were, it was really interesting, because there were probably like 60 people in the group. Half of them were Americans who were like me, like just trying to, well, actually, you know, I was sort of, I'd done more cases than most. But like most, they were, were trying to figure out like how to do this, because 
Like no one really knew how to do it yet. The other half were all Central and South Americans who'd been doing it for years. And I speak Spanish, so like I just immediately gravitated to these guys, and I'm like, hey, can I come visit? And they were like, yeah, sure. So I spent the better part of 2011, 12, and 13 every other month, because you know, I just wanted to do stem cells. Like I, did, I wanted to be a stem cell guy. So I basically stopped doing prolotherapy, I stopped doing PRP, and so my practice was slow, because no one had heard of it back then. Like, it, it didn't like, it was like no, it, it, was, it wasn't happening yet. So I would do like one month at home, and then I'd do one month traveling to these other clinics. Um, one of the people I visited was this Carlos Cecilio Brat, who'd been doing uh, bone marrow from what he, what he had this very old clinic, like in the middle of nowhere in Venezuela, this tiny little town in the mountains. So if there was ever any like question as to my dedication to learning stem cell medicine, yeah. I went to Venezuela and don't go to Venezuela. So, so uh, you know, I went and visited him and he had this like old, this clinic was open from eight in the morning till eight at night. He had two staff rotations, you know, eat like the morning and the afternoon, and then he would just work all day. And he would just like do stem cell treatment after stem cell treatment. It was these, these, these old style beds, almost like chiropractic, you know, like the old school chiropractors that just had these beds separated by curtains. And he would just go from one to the other, putting needles in the sternum, aspirating bone marrow, putting it through an ozone machine, and then giving it IV. And he, and he was the first one. He showed me he had an iPad, and he had like thousands of patient testimonials of like, imagine the con name the condition, and he's treated it with that. And I mean, it was amazing. So I, I mean, it, he charged pennies, and he treated like e the Chavez family to the illiterate farmers and everybody in between. And I was just completely blown away. So then from there, I went to the Stem Cell Institute, which is still in existence and very famous. This is, you know, in the Western Hemisphere, probably the premier uh, stem cell institute. Uh, Neil, Neil Riordan is the founder, and he, he was a brilliant guy. I mean, it's this state-of-the-art, multi-million dollar stem cell lab that grows every imaginable kind of stem cell. And they treat, you know, you name it. They treat all sorts of things. Very expensive. So this was like the complete opposite end of the spectrum from Carlos Cecilio Brat. And what I found was, you know, the Stem Cell Institute got these like amazing outcomes. I mean, not with everybody, of course, but you know, overall they were getting these incredible outcomes. But so did Dr. Brat. I mean, he was getting good outcomes too. It was just different. So I started thinking about this whole idea of sort of cost, benefit, and risk and you know, there, there's sort of three-dimensional uh, uh, graph of sort of like of, of this sweet spot. You know, there had to be this sweet spot that would be right, not just for, you know, it wouldn't be for everybody. I mean, that's the thing. Like, everybody's different. And different people want different things. And so I sort of was on this mission to find out what was right for me and the people that I wanted to help. So uh, I just want to tell you, you guys will probably get a kick out of this story. But uh, one of the people in my travels was uh, uh, Carolina Lucena, who's at the top of this picture. She comes from, uh, her family is considered like a national treasure in Colombia. They're like this dynasty. Her great, great grandfather performed the first cesarean section in Latin America. Her great grandfather performed the first brain surgery in Latin America. Her grandfather performed or, or, or was uh, opened the first pharmacy and did free medical care for the poor. And her father, Dr. Elkin Lucena, did the second in the world, first in Latin America, in vitro fertilization. And um, he, he had an IVF lab in Bogota. That she, she's a cellular biologist, and she ran the lab. And she kind of got burned out on that, and she got into stem cells with her brother, who's also an MD. And so I started traveling down, and I would, I would take my patients who wanted culture-expanded stem cells there. Um, and then I would do some orthopedic ultrasound, because they had ultrasound, because it's a you know IVF clinic. So I would do ultrasound-guided injection for their orthopedic patients. And I, I just I want to tell you guys this story, because it's not something I really get to share in scientific meetings. But I was out to lunch, and Bogota is very elegant, if you haven't been there. It's muy elegante. 
and I'm out. To the, I'm in this nice restaurant with Dr. Elkin, you know, who is, uh, or Dr. Lucena, who's, you know, he's like ro the closest thing to royalty that I've ever encountered. I mean, he's this from, comes from this medical dynasty, and he's just incredibly elegant. I mean, just oozes with, with elegance. And I'm at, at lunch with him and and Carolina, and Carolina said, you know, Harry, why is it that when I, get, you know, she said, the way I can tell how happy stem cells are is how quickly they attach onto the Petri dish. That's like, that, that's the indicator of how like robust and happy they are. She said, when most doctors give me their samples, it usually takes a couple of days. But when I get yours, they attach in a couple of hours. Why is that? And I had no idea. I mean, I really like, I had no, I had no idea what to say, but I felt like under the circumstance I had to think, like really think about it and, and give an honest answer. So I sort of quieted my mind. And I, what popped into my mind was this experience that I'd had where I had, you know, I, I was about three years into doing stem cell therapy. And it's, there's all these steps. Like it's, you know, it's, it, it was much more complex than anything I'd ever done. And I really was looking to get into that flow state. I was trying to reproduce, you know, what I would, ex what I'd experienced with rock climbing. So, um, I remember this, this, this procedure that I did for for the first time, I totally got in a flow state. Like, I didn't have to think about what I was doing. I didn't have to talk to my assistant. She didn't have to talk to me. The music was perfect. The light in the room was, everything was perfect. And it just like, everything flowed. And afterwards, I sat down with this woman that I'd just done the procedure on, and I said, you know, I have to tell you, I just performed you just received the most perfect procedure I've ever performed, and maybe ever will. And she was completely unsurprised, and she said, at this moment, there's 30 people at my house praying for you to do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and I just went, <laughs> uh, OK. okay. Um, so I, I remembered that, and I just said, you know, Carolyn, the only thing I can think of is that when I operate, I clear my mind. I don't think about anything else. I don't think about what I'm going to have for lunch. I don't think about anything else except helping the person who's here in front of me. And Dr. Elkin, who, ne who Dr. Elkin uh, 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 Lucena, who ne almost never speaks, he just sort of went, "Si, sí, señor," and then he went on to tell me that the reason he's such a famous IVF doctor and why his uh, outcomes are so superior to the national average is when he operates, he fills the room with love. He doesn't think about anything else. He completely clears his mind and he thinks about helping the person right in front of him at that moment. So it was just a very nice experience that I had that sort of, it was a feel good moment. I thought I'd tell you guys about that. So one of, the, one of my friends that I worked with over those years when I was commuting to uh, Central America and South America was Carlos Chiraboga in Guayaquil, Ecuador, who's a great friend. This guy, is, he's an orthopedic surgeon and just a gentleman. And during those years, um, I would go to his hospital and I would harvest and prepare stem cells. And then I would hand them over to Carlos and he would use them in traditional orthopedic surgeries. And this was one of the cases that we did. This was, at the time, it was an 11-year-old girl who was thrown from the back of a motorcycle. And she got, she got uh, her, her bone got infected. And so, like, I mean, it just disintegrated. And so this is, like, no good, very bad. This is, you know, she, this girl's probably going to lose her leg above the knee. So, like, very, very bad prognosis. So what Carlos did is he, you know, kind of cleaned off the edges, put a bracket in, brought the bones close together, and every day stretched it one millimeter, but then once a week we would do bone marrow stem cell injections directly into the point of maximal growth. And um, it took, you know, it was many months, uh, it was almost a year of treating this, this little girl, but last I heard she was, you know, out of high school and like played soccer, you know, in high school. And, you know, it wasn't like the best player, but that's cool, you know. She has her leg, and she's pretty happy about that. So, so if, if, if any of you don't know who this is, this is Gary Young, Young Living Essential Oils, who just very tragically died uh, just about six months ago, which was really awful for everybody. And, you know, 
especially him. But anyway, he's a wonderful guy. But he'd been, a, he was another one who'd been a patient of mine for years. And um, I just, I had treated him for years for his back pain. And I did pretty well with him, but I just could never help him with this like midline pain, worse bending forward. He just had to like, I, I could get his pain down to here, but it just never got better in his, in his right in his midline. And I, you know, I was like, Gary, you know, you need stem cells directed directly into your intervertebral discs. And he said, okay. And I said, well, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. But I have a friend in, um, in Texas who does that. And, you know, you have a private plane. Like, I'll go with you. He said, I don't want your friend to do it. I want you to do it. I just went, oh, man. <laughs> I said, here we go again. I said, Gary, like, I, I said, to, in order to inject into vertebral discs, you have to do it with x-ray guidance. And, like, I'm a naturopath. Like, I can't do that, you know. And he's like, I said, Gary, do you know how much criticism I'll get? I mean, seriously, like, m much more than aspirating bone marrow. Like, this is really storming the ivory tower. I mean, I will be called a quack. I mean, it will be awful. And he's like, have you Googled Gary Young lately? You know, he's like, this guy built a $1.5 billion a year corporation with his bare hands. And he's like, if you want to complain to me about people calling you out of your league, like, you're definitely talking to the wrong person here. And I just went, oh. So, you know, I couldn't argue with them. So I learned how to do x-ray guided injection. And the truth is, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's actually a lot easier than you'd think it is. So um, I, just because I have this picture up there, I, I may as well just tell you, like, I do all my procedures under sedation. I have an anesthesiologist puts everybody to sleep. So before anybody gets too grossed out about, like, how much this hurts, it doesn't hurt because you sleep through it. But the amazing thing about, um, about x-ray guided injection is now you can put stem cells anywhere, especially the intervertebral discs epidurals, I mean, pretty much any moving part in the body, you can now, I can now put a needle and put stem cells there. Um, and, and that's, you know, the way this works is you have to get, you know, you can do an IV of stem cells, and it, it's going to do some good, but really, you know, for, for, thing like, for something like an intervertebral disc, there is no blood flow. There is no blood flow in a disc. So if you give something IV, it's not going to get there. You, I mean, you have to actually you have to put it exactly where the problem is. Um, you can also, I mean, now I'm able to do epidurals, which is like magic. You put bone marrow stem cells in the epidural space, and like magic occurs. Like I still, I've been doing this type of stuff. I mean, I've been doing stem cells for eight years. I've been doing the ultra or the fluoroscopic guided for six years, and still to this day, I'm like, really. You know, when I talk to people, how they're doing after. Uh, this is an injection into C1, C2. This is uh, in, your, in your neck, the, the, the joint, the level that's responsible for rotating your head. You know, when you have difficulty turning and checking your blind spot, that's this injection. So, um, you know, so I've been talking about bone marrow stem cells, but the thing is fat is incredibly rich in stem cells. Um, I, I kind of, I didn't start doing fat right away. I started doing it in about 2013. Uh, so essentially what you do is you do uh, liposuction, a miniature liposuction, lipoaspiration. Then you put the fat through a process uh, called enzymatic digestion, where you actually add a, a, a substance called collagenase and, and then put it through this whole process. And whereas from a bone marrow aspiration, we're gonna get in the tens of thousands of stem cells, from a lipo aspiration, we're going to get in the tens of millions of stem cells. So what I um, so it, it, this is about this is what the process looks like. Is uh, it gets incubated and then and then centrifuged and then incubated again. And in that picture, you can see up at the top there's the free fat, and then at the very bottom that little pellet that's the that's the goods that's the stem cells. Um, so when I first started using uh, when I first started using the fat. Um, I, my instinct was to combine the bone marrow with the fat. And um, I thought, you know, here I've got this opportunity to compare them. You know, maybe one's better than the other. Maybe I don't have to do a bone marrow aspiration. And what I found was, as had been my experience, the people who got bone marrow uh, 
got very consistently good results. The people who got the fat, but, I, but usually I'd have to do two treatments. People who got the fat, when it worked, it worked better than the bone marrow. But I had like a 30% non-responder rate. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, and I still don't know why that is. But I, then I started mixing the two together. And what I found is when I use bone marrow combined with fat stem cells, I get the consistency of the bone marrow and the augmented improvement, these like really amazing outcomes as, as, as the fat. So just in the last year, I've started using a couple other products. Now there's a lot of people are starting to use umbilical cord stem cells. I don't really like to use umbilical cord stem cells. And the reason I don't like to use it is I don't really love the idea of putting somebody else's genetic material into my patient. Um, it's probably safe. And I just don't like it. And I, you know, probably is not, I just, I don't, I don't really like it. But there is an umbilical cord product that I use, which is the Wharton's jelly. So this is without cells. This is the Wharton's jelly is the insulative layer of the umbilical cord. It's this gelatinous substance that is made up of bioidentical human derived hyaluronic acid and chondroitin sulfate. So this is like the ground substance of joints of discs. This is, you know, this is the matrix that is connective tissue. So what I like about using the Wharton's jelly is it gives the stem cells the, the basically the building blocks that it needs to, to grow new connective tissue. The thing that's probably the most exciting thing to come along in regenerative medicine in the last couple of years is exosomes. So this is like so incredibly slick. Essentially what this Chimera Labs does is they take, this is a lab in New Jersey, they take, uh, they, call, they uh, recruit these women who are scheduled to undergo cesarean sections. They screen them for every imaginable com communicable disease. If they pass that, then um, they, they give birth to the baby and the lab takes possession of the placenta. They then take the stem cells from the placenta, culture expand them, so you grow hundreds of millions of them, and um, put them in a stressful culture medium. So you basically trick the stem cells into thinking that their host is under duress. So they sprout these vesicles filled with growth factors that are, in fact, the active ingredient of stem cells. When, you know, when we're talking about that paracrine effect where the stem cells are communicating, that's, that is the currency. That's the active ingredient. Now, what makes my stem cells 50-year-old stem cells is as we age, we lose the ability to manufacture those very growth factors. So what I like about this is they take these placental stem cells, which are the most robust stem cell, have forced them to grow these, these exosomes. They then discard the stem cell, including the other person's genetic material, and just keep the exosomes, which are these little vesicles with just the growth factors, no genetic material. Now the membrane of that exosome is identical to the membrane of my stem cells. So what we think from looking at, this, at the research of the use of exosomes in mostly kidney disease, what we think happens is when we add the exosomes to your own stem cells, that your own stem cells actually envelop them into themselves, thereby effectively making your own stem cells a younger person's stem cell. I've been very happy with using those, especially in my 65 and older crowd. Because what I find is when I treat people, when I treat young people, I mean, it's just so easy. But when I treat older people, it's, it, my, my results drop off. You know, I do great with some people, but then I have a higher non-responder rate the, the more the population ages. And since I've, my experience so far has been when I use the exosomes in addition to someone's own stem cells, it seems to really make a person react to the treatment like a younger person. So the thing that's really, I mean, if you look at the mushrooming cloud of scientific data on stem cells, you name a condition and it is being studied with the use of stem cells. Um, I only treat musculoskeletal pain. I'm in uh, Northern California, so I figured I'd put an Alex Gray picture in there. Um, so, you know, I just treat musculoskeletal pain. That's all I do. I, I like to do one thing and be really good at it. Um, there's, you know, sort of two categories. There's peripheral joints, 
which is you know, shoulders, elbows, wrists, and hand, hips, knees, ankle, foot. Uh, and mostly what we end up treating is arthritis because that's, that's a, a common thing. I mean, that's just wear and tear of the, of the joints. And that is, uh, you know, we, we tend to look at the x-rays a lot, but the truth is if you look at the data, it doesn't, like how bad the x-ray looks, as I said earlier, like really does not predict how much pain the person is experiencing, doesn't predict how well they're gonna respond to treatment. It's really just like, you listen to the, per you ask the person questions, you, you listen to the answers. But, um, but treating joints is rewarding, but I must say treating spine is really my passion. And I would say the, the reason for that is because if somebody has an arthritic knee and I keep them away from the surgeon, like that's great, you know, and that's, that's a, that's a, it's a wonderful thing. But worst case scenario, they can have a knee replacement and it's not the end of the world. But with the spine, there's no good options. Like when I get a 30 year old with a severely dehydrated lumbar disc, Man, there's, there's nothing, like there is nothing for that, except narcotics, like they, it's narcotics or nothing because epidurals, steroid epidurals don't help and like you, can't, you really can't fuse a 30 year old because now you're, you're damning them to a lifetime of continual fusion and if they live to be old enough, their entire spine will be fused. So um, this is a paper that I published on, um, on, on treating desiccated discs, dehydrated discs uh, in mostly young people, and I mean, it's just phenomenal. Like, I, I can't even believe it. I just, I presented this paper at a meeting last weekend, and it was funny because I went on right after this guy who is, you know, a, a, a invasive uh, a radiologist, an interventional radiologist, who is like credentialed up and down to the North Pole to the South Pole, like doing, and he, the what, what he's doing is he's, taking like freshly, he's getting uh, organ donors and taking uh, like cadaver discs and chopping them up and then taking the stem cells out of this cadaver's vertebral bodies. And it's all, you know, hospital, it's like the opposite extreme of what I'm doing. And if you put our charts next to each other, it's almost identical, the outcomes we're getting. I mean, it was so weird for us to look at each other. We were kind of like, you know, I'm this like poodle and he's this pit bull <laughs> and we're kind of looking at each other and it's just, we're like, it's staggering that we're getting the same outcomes even though we're at it's, it's such opposite ends of the spectrum philosophically and, and from a pedigree perspective. Um, something that I've started doing uh, in the last couple of years, a lot of my patients are farmers and ranchers and oil fill workers. Uh, I just have, you know, I get those guys. And these are people who have arthritis throughout their entire bodies. And literally, I mean, they're like riddled with arthritis. And because um, I work with an anesthesiologist and because I've never billed insurance, so I've never been brainwashed into thinking that you can only treat one area at a single time, I do a lot of these, I've gotten a reputation as this guy who does like big treatments. So I'll do like in a single sitting just about someone's entire body and I sort of affectionately named it the full body stem cell makeover. Well, when I started getting guys like Dave in, when I started getting Ben Greenfield, when I started getting these, you know, these biohackers in, I thought, you know, I wonder if people would be interested in this. And so I started offering it. And I can't believe how many people, like, yeah, they're like, yeah, I want that. And so what we do with full body stem cell makeovers, we take a large volume of bone marrow, uh, we take a large volume of fat, we isolate the stem cells, we concentrate the stem cells, we put a ton of exosomes in there, and then we literally, over the next two hours, inject the entire body. The spine from the base of the skull down to the tailbone, both sides, flip them over, both shoulders, both sh elbows, both wrists and hands, both hips, both knees, both ankles, feet. Um, I had a little video of Ben Greenfield talking about his experience, but we, because of the technical uh, stuff, I, d I decided to delete it. So um, it's something that, I mean, we're doing more and more of, and I figure that Silicon Valley Health Institute, you guys probably would be interested to know about it. So um, this is my other car. This is the Pilot Fish. And there was a time in my life uh, when having a, uh, a 40 foot long, 8,000 pound fish made of steel that I'd drive at Burning Man there was a time when that was like the proudest achievement in my life. And I used to finish talks with pictures of the, 
of the pilot fish. But then I had these little meatballs uh, that are, you know, are kind of a late addition for this this sort of late late starter. And this is they might just look like normal kids to you, but that's pretty much what they look like all the time to me. <laughs> so anyway, that's thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to speak to you guys. Questions now? Yeah, questions. So who, uh, are we on? Yeah. So who would like to ask a question? Right here. You mentioned that uh, you and this other doc that was sort of the Ferrari guy. <laughs> uh -huh. whatever. Uh, what, what would the difference in cost be between the two treatments? Oh, do you mean the radiologist? Well, his is all done uh, under, it, it's research. So it's, you might get placebo. It's, you know, a double blind placebo. So it's, it's free if you're, in, unless you get placebo, and then it's a bummer. So, um, so you were saying the two, you were saying the two ch charts were the, the same output, I mean, the same outcome. outcomes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, just, yep. just talking about, yeah, just talking about um, the, the study that he is, the, the very formal scientific study that he's doing and my goofy little survey that I was doing. So yeah, his, with his, he, he, it's not private. It's, you know, it's a study. What was his name? Beale, Doug Beale. I was just wondering if you always inject into muscular tissue or uh, joints, and if you ever, it goes through the bloodstream, the mm -hmm. stem cells, and kind of another question is kind of has to do with autoimmune conditions. If you always treat the site that's having pain versus kind of the immune system, mm -hmm. and so how do you get to something that makes the whole body system? Sure. So um, we we just treat musculoskeletal pain. So um, be, because of that, we're really focused on the treatment of whatever structure is involved. There are clinics that do systemic treatments. Um, they are very much in the crosshairs of the FDA. And, um, and, I, and I really, because of, I, I just want to keep on doing what I do, because I think I'm good at it. I really just focus on what I'm good at, which is treating musculoskeletal pain. But there are plenty of uh, clinics in the United States currently that are doing systemic treatments. I think, I think quite good. I mean, I think for, for all sorts of things, for neurologic conditions, for autoimmune. I mean, in the scientific literature, autoimmune disease is a major indication for stem cell therapy, intravenous stem cell therapy, which I don't treat. But, I mean, it is a major indication. So yeah, whoever's got uh, what, the if, what if you squirt this stuff into the brain? I'm sorry? What if you squirt this stuff into the brain? Yeah, so there's the thing about uh, exosomes is exos so the, 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 the trick about getting stuff into the blood brain barrier is, um, is, is you know, getting them, getting them into the brain that way. So the nice thing about exosomes is exosomes are small enough to freely cross the blood brain barrier. Now, as far as stem cells, um, there are, there's two, there's either you can give it intravenously or intraarterially, and what you do is you preload with a medication called mannitol. And mannitol is a very large sugar that's used in emergency medicine that um, temporarily, it's a, it's a diuretic also, but it temporarily renders permeable the blood-brain barrier. So you can give mannitol intravenously and then follow that with intravenous stem cells. Or you, you know, there are clinics that will do intrathecal injections, which is you know, basically like a spinal. And then the other way is there is a guy uh, in, in Beverly Hills, whose name is, it's going to come to me in a second. He'll, I'll remember his name in a moment. But he's actually putting in what's called an Omaya Reservoir, which is a port in the skull. He just drills a hole in the skull and then puts a little port there so he can inject directly into the brain. And he's treating dementia. Okay, so let's, we'll do over here, and then I'll, I'll come back over there. Uh, I recently had received... Uh, advertisements and uh, videos on stem cell therapy that's now legal in Texas. Mm -hmm. And they had a series of like nine or 10 or they wanted you to watch them in series, okay? And I got two things like that that were advertised on YouTube and such as that. Are you familiar with that and what's going on with down in Texas? Well, Texas is the only state that actually has a law saying 
that stem cell therapy is legal, which is good, but it's also bad because then there's a lot, you know, it, then they have very strict criteria. You know, it has to be done in a hospital or a surgical center. It has to be done, you know, there's actually like, it, it's, in a way, they're more limited. Uh, in the rest of the states, the rest of us are just kind of saying, look, this is, this is up to the medical boards. This is not up to the federal government. So we're just going to keep doing what we're doing until, you know, until told otherwise. Now, there are, um, there are you know, the problem with fat-derived stem cells is the, um, the FDA has just recently, in the last year, uh, had the Department of Justice sue the two leading adipose-derived stem cell clinics in the United States, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. So, yeah, so we're, we might lose adipose-derived stem cells, depending on how that case, depending on how that uh, trial turns out, there's a chance that we could lose adipose-derived stem cells, in which case I'll just switch back to bone marrow and exosomes. Okay, now over here. And the reason why the case has been brought? Well, what's the problem? The you know, there's what they say is the problem, and then what there's what we think is the problem. And you know, I hate to sound cynical, but you know, we think this is that stem cell therapy, especially intravenous, because the thing about adipose-derived stem cells is you get a huge number of them, and they can be delivered intravenously. So now you're like directly competing with big pharma, who has stem cell products currently in the pipeline. Sure. So you know. You know, and the argument that the cell surgical network is making, and that you know, it, it, and that you know, the, pro the proponents of adipose-derived stem cells is, hey, this is a medical procedure. Like this is not a drug. I take, I do a liposuction. Right. I isolate the stem cells. How is that a drug? That in no way resembles a drug. Right. But that's that's the argument they're making is that it is in fact a drug and a non-FDA approved drug. So briefly, why is the body putting the cells into the adipose tissue, and then along with that, is there any limit to the number of times you can do a procedure sure. based on somehow using them up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, how do you think about that over time? Well, the reason it's in adipose is just because adipose is highly vascularized, and and mesenchymal stem cells come from pericytes. So wherever there are blood vessels, there are pericytes, and pericytes are what become MSCs. So. You know, I, that's as much as we know. Um, there's no real upper limit that I'm aware of. I mean, it's the, I I stopped bringing patients to Bogota, Colombia, because you know to culture expand their cells because I found that really we for the treatment of musculoskeletal pain, which is what I do, we do one or two treatments and we're usually done. And then I might see, hear from them again five years later. But um, you know, this isn't something you'd want to like. Now, if you have a neurologic, if you have like Parkinson's or MS or something like that, that's a different story. Then, then you really do want to be treated like once a month or once every other month for the rest of your life. And then you want to use either culture expanded uh, umbilical cells or your own culture expanded. And that's where you need to go to, you know, you need to go abroad currently to do that. Thank you. Next, okay. Next, you had your hand up there. You don't mean go abroad once a month, do you? Well, theoretically, Maybe. yeah. Okay. I mean, the, to, to do it legally, yeah. That, that's not my real question, but that just mm -hmm. came up right there. Mm -hmm. But my question is about the arthritis. Are you talking RA or are you talking osteo? Osteoarthritis, yeah, because RA is a systemic disease. Is what, about, disease. what about um, osteopenia and osteoporosis? Yeah, those are systemic diseases that I don't really treat. And I, I'm not really aware of using stem cells to treat osteoporosis. Um, there might be people studying that, but I'm just not aware of it. I, I just wonder why, mm -hmm. because that seems so widespread and so epidemic. Well, I think epidemic. osteoporosis is really like a childhood disease. You know, it's really, it's something that you, you don't build enough, grow, you don't build enough bone density early in life, so you like deplete your reserves as you get older. And then you do stuff, you know, you do, and then there's other things we do with lifestyle to, to accelerate that depletion, but I don't know that stem cells would really reverse that. It just seems like it would, but yeah, I've heard that before. So. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how it's used for, say, a vertebra that has deteriorated, has crushed, mm -hmm. or collapsed, 
and spinal stenosis? Sure. So let me answer spinal stenosis first. Okay. So spinal stenosis is, you know, you have the spinal cord and then the, the tunnel through yes. which the spinal cord travels is the spinal canal. Yes. And spinal stenosis is the narrowing of that canal. Yes. And it, um, it usually is caused by thickening of the ligaments. It, it can be from uh, a, a herniated disc, but it frequently is just the, the ligaments that travel along the length of the spinal canal thicken and then over time actually ossify. You know, they become like okay. an annular bone spur. It's like a circular bone spur. Okay. And so that is really a hypoxic condition. That's from, you know, lack of, you know, you're, you, you lose blood flow and then you get that ossification. Okay. So I treat a lot of spinal stenosis and I mean, I can't, I don't know for sure why it works, but it seems to work. And the reason I think it works is because of this angiogenesis, yes. where we're growing healthy new blood vessels that can kind of reverse that, that ossification, that, that circular bone spur. Okay. Um, as far as the deterior, as it, a crush fracture would be tr difficult to treat. I mean, if it's really like the vertebral body's completely smashed down, probably somebody wants to talk to a surgeon. But um, sort of, you know, generic degenerative disc disease, we do quite well with that. Good. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Let's see, let's go here. In older patients um, that have um, less, in older patients that have um, less, less stem cells, have you? In older patients that, um, have lower stem cells, have you combined um, things like uh, CB2 agonists to increase their amount of stem cells so that it will make your treatment work better? I don't, and that's because um, I don't really want, I, I want to sneak up on the stem cells. Like, I don't want to do anything that's going to like, you know, there's all sorts of strategies to increase the number of circulating stem cells, to like mobilize your stem cells. And I, I don't really want to do that. I want to sneak up and surprise them. When I get put that needle in the bone, like I want to catch them sleeping. You know, I really, I want them to be in, in the bone marrow when I take it out. Um, also, uh, I, I, I sort of don't want to get too cute also. Like I sort of, I like keeping it kind of simple um, just because that suits my personality. Um, I don't really throw a lot of stuff. It's, you know, like with, that was always what I'd, with Dave Asprey, I mean, it would always come back to that. He'd be like, well, what about, blah, 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 blah. and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Like, I, I don't want to get, I tend not to get too cute. <laughs> That's the best. Even in older patients that have uh, lower stem cells. Well, counts. then I like to add the exosomes. You know, I like to use their own because you, they still have them. I mean, they have a decreased number and it's, and decreased function, but then I like to throw in those exosomes because I think it really does you know, sort of revitalize their own stem cells. Thank you. Sure. Hi. What is the approximate cost for a therapy of the de de degenerated disc? Um, so we, t you mean at my, at my, cl mm -hmm. at my place. So yeah. uh, for real simple treatments, it's, you know, about starts at about 8,000 for moderate, you know, it's around 15,000 for spine sorts of things. It can get, it can go up from there. It really just sort of depends on how many things we're injecting, and then how if we're adding a bunch of exosomes and stuff. Um, my costs are pretty comparable nationally, except the difference is usually like when you look at a lot of the other people, it's about the same price, but there it's just bone marrow, or it's just adipose, or it's just umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. So my price is about like those guys, except you're getting. All you know, all three types. Mm -hmm. yeah, wh where do you um, get the exosomes? Uh, Chimera Labs, oh, okay. which is uh, based out of New Jersey. The medical director is a guy named Doug Spiel, who's a crazy man and a great guy. Okay, thank you. So we've got a lot of questions here, but I think we'll we'll take a couple more, and then um, those of you can, uh, as we go on a break a little bit later, you can. Go ahead and come on. Okay. Go down and talk with them individually. So let's go back here. Hi. Uh, on the full body stem or the full mm -hmm. stem cell makeover, 
How many people have you done it on and what did they report? Well, there's people who, okay, so I've done a bunch like as far over as- Over a hundred or oh, a yeah, thousand? Uh, hundreds wow. of, of, of the ranchers and farmers and oil field workers who it wasn't like necessarily like packaged as that. As far as like the anti-aging people who are just doing it, you know, yeah, the biohackers. Oh, probably, you know, 20, 30. Um, and they love it. I mean, the, one of the early ones was Ben Greenfield, and he loved it. Like, he, he, he's like, I mean, I'll, I've got, a, I'm getting ready to come out with another little video of him on, on my YouTube page. But he's like, he feels like he's on fire. Now, he's doing a bunch of different stuff. But, I mean, he really credits that to, he has, like, he does those, you know, those endurance races and wins. And, you know, he f says he's, like, recovering crazy fast as a result, so. I was wondering if you inject directly into the disc, does it, does it damage the disc itself? Does well, it leave a hole or anything? I don't think so, no. I mean, there, there is, you know, the, the detractors of injecting discs say, well, if you look at the data of people who've had uh, uh, provocative disc discography, uh, that you know the, it actually causes permanent damage. Well, I don't think that's a good analogy because when you do a discogram, you're putting a big needle in there and you're like shoving a bunch of air in there. You're like really blowing it up as much as you can, and this is like one cc of fluid. You know, it's just a very different animal. And these are people who already have damaged discs. Now when I do the full body makeover, the anti-aging stuff, we don't inject discs. I only inject a disc if it really is diseased and, and very painful. So these are people whose like lives are miserable because of pain and we inject them and they get better. So theoretically 10 years, I mean like we don't know. I've only been doing it for six years. So I don't, beyond six years, I don't know. But there's people I've injected six years ago who are still doing great. So, and those people, 100% of them will say they're glad they did it, so. Okay, so uh, like I said, if you have more questions, please come down and talk with Dr. Adelson uh, in person, and let's please thank Dr. Adelson one more time. Woo.